The weekend of October 17th and 18th, 2020, should have seen humanists from all over Ireland gathering in Cork City for the All-Ireland Humanist Conference. A full weekend of speakers had been lined up, but circumstances beyond our control meant that gathering together simply wasn't possible. As has been the trend in 2020, we turned to technology and the idea of a virtual gathering on Zoom, with the conference lineup considerably reduced. All the same, when around 60 humanists from around Ireland gathered virtually on the afternoon of October 17th, it produced an excellent discussion around the topic of racism, inequality and fascism. The event was co-organised by the Irish Freethinkers and Humanists and the Humanist Association of Ireland. We were delighted to have Dr Salome Mabugwa of the Irish Human Rights and Equality Commission and author and activist Matthew F. Collins as speakers. What follows is a recording of that day. Salome spoke first, followed by Matthew. There was then a break, followed by a reflection from Tom Woolley of the Irish Freethinkers and Humanists, and a roundtable discussion chaired by Ruth Scott. But the afternoon began with an address from the chair of the Humanist Association of Ireland, Aidan Pender. Do enjoy. Good afternoon, everybody, and uh, it's a pleasure to, to meet everybody, if only virtually. And as Eamon was saying, uh, I think we all look forward to the time we can get back together and uh, uh, meet and have these conversations over a cup of tea or a drink or whatever it might be. Um, I'd like to add my words of welcome to um, uh, Salome and uh, Matthew. And uh, it's, it's wonderful to have such distinguished speakers joining us and contributing their insights uh, with us this afternoon. Uh, and on that note, I have to, uh, I think, immediately declare a profound level of incompetence because when I look at the title of the conference, I, I, I think I'm probably woefully unqualified uh, to address this, but it wouldn't be the first time in my life I've spoken when I'm woefully unqualified to do so. So uh, uh, I hope you'll be uh, forgiving of me. And uh, the most we can say is I won't take too much of your time, I hope, about 10 minutes of that. I need to put on my little uh, clock here what I think of it. Um, so just to begin, um, as I say, I think the, what struck me when I looked at the, the conference title in particular, and I, I kind of, you know, I like to be diligent to words, and if the words say humanists challenge to racism, inequality and fascism, uh, well, first of all, that sounds to me to be a, uh, an entirely uh, um, pertinent thing for us all to be talking together about, uh, and I think racism, inequality and fascism, unfortunately, are all too real. Uh, in the world we live in. And I think humanism does need to find a response. It's, it's, a, it's a very big issue. Uh, it, these aren't things we solve in a day or two. But nevertheless, I think humanism um, as a movement needs to be seen to be making some response to this. And we in Ireland, uh, I think, need to identify perhaps what it is we can uh, contribute to that. And, you know, reflecting on, on those words, uh, I, I thought back to events earlier this year, which I think have uh, almost um, alarmed and frightened and upset all of us. And I'm thinking particularly of uh, the young man Atmud Arbery in um, Georgia, who was out jogging uh, one afternoon when three white men decided to get into a pickup truck and pursue him and uh, shoot him down. And uh, that strikes me as just an appalling act. We then saw this amplified even further with the the uh, unfortunate and tragic death of George Floyd uh, out about his business one afternoon. And again, the white policeman who uh, killed him that day. So, you know, when you look at these things, there are issues out there where I think humanism has to present itself and say something about these. And you look even at the, the Black Lives Matter uh, 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 response. Uh, and even those three words, the idea that Black Lives Matter, the idea that we actually have to say Black Lives Matter. It has to be voiced as if it can't just be implicit and fundamental and taken. It has to be stated, Black Lives Matter. And there's all kinds of other things that matter, climate action, hunger, poverty, designed in social and economic exclusion in our societies. Um, lack of access for the two most fundamental things that I think we need as people, access to healthcare and access to education. And particularly, I think, in certain societies, the exclusion of young girls from education and all the negative impacts that has on their capacity to contribute to society. And then also the denial of basic freedoms, which we as humanists see, particularly in cases where individuals are attempting to ex express their, their freedom of action and to move from a position of imposed faith uh, to one of chosen faithless. Uh, and uh, we know the cases that 
are going on where people are, you know, enduring the consequences of uh, regimes who don't like them thinking for themselves. Um, I have three or four small points I just want to make, and the first of them is just uh, uh, something that's stuck with me. I had the privilege about two and a half years ago of seeing the, um, or attending the 25th anniversary HAI event uh, at which Professor Alan Grayling spoke, the AC Grayling lecture two and a half years ago. And um, I wasn't sure what to expect, but I was hugely impressed and really impressed by what uh, AC Grayling told us. And um, at one point in the presentation, he paused and uh, asked a fundamental a basic question. And I did go to Eamon's point about preparation. I did go back and look at the speech online uh, again a day or two back just to make sure that my recollection of this was accurate, but happily it was. He asked a question about uh, what is the good life? Yeah, as a humanist, what is the good life? And uh, I, I, I'm not going to do justice to this. I'm, I'm not going to be as eloquent as AC Grayling. But um, in effect, he answered his own question by saying that the good life is a considered life. And that was the point I was very struck by. And I've held on to that thought since then. And it's why I checked back to make sure I was correct in saying this. But he said it's a considered life. And I think what he was suggesting was that it was a life where an individual person uh, through their own reason and capacity for thought took responsibility for their own actions, their behaviors. It, it was a life that was considered. It wasn't, in other words, a life that was led based upon a set of received wisdoms that somebody else passed on to you. Uh, and they're just somebody else's received wisdoms. It was the idea that you have a responsibility to think for yourself and, and to put in place as it were a considered life. And I thought that was a wonderful idea. I've never thought of it like that, but I've, I've seldom stopped thinking of it since then. And I'm very impressed by it. If we turn it around, of course, you know, what is a bad life? And I suppose by implication, a bad life might not necessarily be a considered one, but it is one perhaps where one goes through one's life without considering, without determining how it is you wish to behave and act. So the idea of a considered life, and this is the freedom I think that humanism brings to all of us, the humanism and the support and the encouragement to use our reason and our capacity for thought to, to work out for ourselves. What is the proper way to behave? How should we arrange ourselves uh, in our families and our communities so as to lead a considered and proper life? And there was one piece in the Amsterdam Declaration that I always liked on this, and I'm just gonna read it very quickly. It was one of those very short list of, of principles, but it said that humanism is a life stance aiming at the maximum possible fulfillment through the cultivation of ethical and creating living and offers an ethical and rational means of addressing the challenges of our times. Humanism can be a way of life for everyone everywhere. And I like the simplicity of that, that humanism is a way of life for all of us everywhere. It doesn't have to be a stellar philosophy or any kind of profound thinking, but it is a way of setting up our lives for ourselves in a proper way. So moving on from that, as a second point, uh, funnily enough, somebody, a friend of mine was talking to me uh, some days ago and he, he, he gave me a little phrase which he said uh, I, I might remember, uh, or you might remember Aidan, and of course I didn't remember it, but he reminded me of this little phrase. And uh, it was a phrase from Marcus Aurelius, the Roman uh, emperor and philosopher, um, who uh, was a, a very distinguished thinker, and um, he, Marcus Aurelius, um, referred in terms and a stoic but as a stoic he urged his fellows to um, be tolerant and to be tolerant even of what he called the emptily opinionated and that was the phrase that stuck with me the idea of being emptily opinionated opinionated but on the basis of nothing and uh, I thought it was a great line and I, I went back I, I did you may be surprised to know I did have a copy of uh, Marcus Aurelius's meditations in the house and I went back to have a look at it and to find the reference to the tolerance for the entity opinionated there and uh, it's a lovely little passage and you can see where a stoic is coming from like that uh, i suppose what it prompted in my mind though while of course trying to adhere as fully as possible in all times to, to tolerance it occurred to me that i don't know if there are maybe entity opinionated uh, people knocking around with opinions but there are certainly it seems to me at least lazily uh, opinionated people or ill-informed opinionated people and unfortunately, a lot of these people find their way into public life. And we see every day the kind of alarming punch and Judy show that all these narcissists and uh, um, uh, 
populists, kleptocrats, um, downright delusional people, uh, and, 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 and the turmoil that they visit upon the world in public life. And again, you wonder about this, how does this come to pass and what does humanism say about this? It seems to me that that kind of the capacity for that lazy um, opinion to endure and that lazy opinion to in fact uh, thrive and prosper in our societies is down to a significant level of ignorance and fear. And I think it's an ignorance on the part of us all collectively, perhaps that allows this to develop. And it's certainly a fear, a fear generated by people now who are using anxiety and fear that they instill in sections of society to suit their own political ends. And in particular, I think the far right, we all understand what's happening there and the potential for further damage. And in relation to ignorance, of course, the response to ignorance, you would imagine, must be education in some shape or form, not necessarily education in the classroom, although that's where we all begin, but education in its broad and many forms. And of course, education uh, for humanists and certainly for the HAI is a core, it's the core principle and the object of our existence. And I think we need to perhaps consider how we can um, do more in that area or expand our reach and our impact in terms of education initiatives. Um, and within the HAI, this is something certainly within the board, something we've been talking about in terms of planning the next couple of years, trying to think about what do we need to do over the next two years. And education is very much at the top of that list. The third point, I said it's only four, so this will soon finish. The third point was about, uh, in our own case as the HAI, our posture as an organization. And um, I've, I've worked over my life with many organizations, with many and in many organizations. And one of the issues that always crops up when you're talking to people uh, about their organization and when you're trying to say, could we do better, could we perform better, both in commercial businesses and also in lots of not-for-profits. But one of the issues that comes up Inevitably, and I, I, I give it voice if nobody else does, but it's, 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 it's in the folds of the tablecloth. It might not be on the, t on the table, but it's in the folds of the tablecloth, kind of nicely hidden. And it's about um, visibility and relevance. In other words, as an organization, uh, as an entity, are we, are we visible and are we relevant? And um, I don't know if in our own case in the HII, for example, uh, I don't have a great sense of how visible we are. I, I absolutely am, am rock solid sure were relevant, no question about that. So the one thing though that any organization can't be, not for long anyway, it can't be invisible and irrelevant. You, if you stay invisible and irrelevant for long, you'll be dead. Probably the only worst thing is to be visible doing irrelevant things. That's probably even worse. But uh, so there's a big issue there, I think, for us to reflect on as humanists, and certainly in, sorry, in the case of our own organization, um, is this issue of visibility and relevance and when I say visibility, I don't in any sense mean the, the, the idea of pursuing vi visibility for its own sake, just to make noise and to be visible for its own sake. That's not at all what I mean. What I mean is visibility in terms of the profile and prominence of the HAI uh, as an effective and uh, a visible contributor to Irish civil society and as a leading voice in Irish civil society. So it's not visible just to show off or anything of, of that sort. It's visibility and relevance. And, you know, I think there's, there's an issue on both of those that, again, as humanists, as all of us together as humanists, need to reflect on uh, in order to empower the HAI uh, to, to do those things it wants to do. Um, and there's also, I think, an idea there of um, a friend of mine used to use the phrase, there should be no silent giving, you know? And sometimes silent giving, giving would seem to be a very proper thing. You know, if you were giving something, you didn't make a song and dance about it. You know, it wasn't, you were silent about it. And I think that's understandable and that's right. But no silent giving in the sense that when the HAI is doing something or we as humanists are doing something and it's, it's good and honest endeavor, where we're actually trying to do something good and proper, we should try to make sure that uh, we're seen to do that because that's part of the education. That's part of spreading. It's, 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 it's acting out or evidencing our own belief system and our value system. And it's a way of messaging, I think, to society that humanism actually is a, a, a substantial force for good. And the last thing that I was going to, um, yeah, the final point um, is, I suppose, again, another little line. I was always taken by Al Gore's 
uh, I think it was the title of his book, An Inconvenient Truth. And it's a lovely idea that certain truths are inconvenient to certain people, you know. Uh, climate change, of course, being a, a huge inconvenient truth for many people. And I think that the inconvenient truth for us as humanists uh, on this island, I think both in the uh, Irish, the humanists and free thinkers and in the HAI, is we have limited resources. We have very limited financial resources and very li limited human resources. We are, as an association, extraordinarily fortunate in the case of the HAI uh, to have uh, Kilda and uh, Gillian as our two uh, uh, executive resources. Both Kilda and Gillian are extraordinarily talented and hardworking people and uh, get through, as they say these days, get through a shed load of work all the time. But they're both part-time, roughly 50% part-time. So if we could stitch Gillian and Kilda together, we'd have one full-time resource. So if, in effect, we're an organization with one full-time resource. And that means we're limited in what we can do. Um, it means that when we want to uh, generate these responses to these um, trends in society around racism, inequality, and fascism, when we want to respond in some way, we want to say something or do something about that, we don't have a very uh, extensive reach. And I think what it comes down to is we, we need to face the reality that the board can't do these things. It's a volunteer board. It's very limited. So we have something like over 700 people in the HAI. And the fact is, despite the limitations and resources in terms of money and people in the HAI, as a community of people together, 750, we possess an enormous, or we represent an enormous wealth of human and intellectual capital. There are many, many fine and gifted people in the HAI who bring with them uh, a wealth of experience, insight, knowledge, know-how. And there's a huge reservoir there. And the challenge seems to be, how do we uh, mobilize that, that reservoir of knowledge and talent and insight and intellectual capacity? How do we mobilize it? Because if we don't answer that question, if we can't mobilize it, the chances are we'll be doing very little. And, you know, we're talking about this at the board because we were planning for a couple of years and saying, what, what, how, should we, how should we arrange ourselves? And we're going back to core principles, back to the basics around education and some of the allied issues uh, around education. And, you know, we, we, we probably need to just say, look, we've got maybe two or three focus areas, two or three key, uh, key areas we're going to focus on over the next two years or so. And let's try and really make some change. And we need to get away from the what question and ask the how question. The what question is, what should we be doing? Now, I think we're pretty, we understand that. What should we be doing? It goes back to our basic principles and our beliefs as, uh, as, and values as humanists. So it's not so much what, it's how. How do we do these things? So how do we move past simply making assertions of uh, concern or confidence or whatever we might want to assert around issues, but we get away from assertions and demonstrate. We don't assert, we can demonstrate, find these focus areas and try and set ourselves up. There, there must be people, uh, I think, who would like to come together if they were assisted to do so. People have to be helped, I think, to get involved and do these things. And it's very, very difficult. Uh, I'm the first to admit that. I mean, I'm a, I'm a kind of a reluctant volunteer of a busy life. We all have busy lives and we all have demands. So it's hard to make time and space, whether it's your family or your community or your work. It's very hard to make space. And yet, I suppose what I'm saying is, if we fail to help people and all of us to make space, we're not going to get too far with these key focus areas. And just to finish on another note, um, I'm a bit of a fan of Lou Reed and the Velvet Underground. And you don't, uh, you don't often hear Marcus Aurelius and Lou Reed bumping into each other in the same uh, few words. But uh, he, uh, Lou Reed, had a great line in one of the songs, and it's, it's a kind of an excoriating put down. Uh, and it's what we, we in Ireland would refer to say as the, um, the well-intentioned. You know, we're all well-intentioned, we're all good people, and we're all well-intentioned. And he was kind of getting at the ineffectiveness of the well-intentioned. But he's in a, a line in the song where, oh, and of course, as a, it's an Americanism, so he wouldn't say the well-intentioned. He talks about the goodly hearted, you know, the goodly hearted, good people, well-intentioned. So he says, you can't depend on the goodly hearted. The goodly hearted make lampshades and soap, you know, and that's the problem in terms of getting anything moving any further. So I, I think the challenge we face, and it will only be, I think, by the collective involvement of the, in all, by all of us, not these six people there or those six people over there, that all of us find some way and some incentive to get involved. 
and, and we can move the HEI. I think what I'd love to see is the, the, the prominence, the profile, and the position of the HAI in Irish civic society and its contribution being recognized and made in a constructive and positive way. And in doing so, we'll move the humanist agenda up an echelon or two within Ireland. And we we'll certainly, if we can do this right, we'll certainly do more than make lampshades and so. Thank you very much. Thanks for your time and your forbearance. And I'll pass you back now to Eamon. Thank you, Aidan. It's actually myself, Ruth, who's uh, oh, going to jump in at this stage. That's quite all right. Uh, thank you so much, Good Aidan Pender, Chair of the Humanist Association of Ireland. I know there's a few people would have uh, joined just uh, uh, after the very start of our um, meeting there. So for those of you who maybe didn't get to hear Aidan even speak at the AGM, this may have been your first time to get to hear him speak. And we're very grateful and certainly a lot of interesting reflections there. And uh, that particular phrase, uh, a good life is a considered life, certainly uh, Francesca message that it's, it stood out to her. And uh, Alan Tuffery has posted uh, in the comments at the side, the considered life, free, creative, informed and chosen, a life of achievement and fulfillment, of pleasure and understanding, of love and friendship. In short, the best human life in a human world, humanly live, lived. And that's accredited to uh, Grayling, as you quite rightly said, Aidan. Um, so thank you for that. I loved the phrase as well, emptily opinionated. And I think that might be my new favourite burn for people who are uh, annoying me in the future. Uh, so again, those that are may just have arrived, just to give you a quick rundown, we're going to have uh, Dr. Yeah, Salome. We're going to have... We're going to have Dr. Salome uh, Mbugwa speaking for approximately 30 minutes and then Matthew Collins of Hope Not Hate. And then we'll have a 15 minute comfort break. Then we'll come back to a round table discussion. So again, uh, leading into that, if while we're listening to the next two speakers, if you have any questions or comments, we're asking that in oh. order to facilitate people being able to ask their questions that they use the chat function, which if you move your mouse around, you'll see it at the bottom of your screen, I think. Um, and you can pop a question in there on text and we will credit you when we read it out and all. So um, we are ready to go then with Dr. Salome. So let me, uh, very happy to introduce you. You're so welcome to our, our humanist summer school, essentially. Uh, Dr. Salome Mbugwa of the IHREC is good to speak. I mean, you've all read the information on the email, but you couldn't let her speak without acknowledging the great skills, talents, and knowledge base that she brings to our, our, our day to day. Uh, so she is a researcher, a gender equality activist, a human rights advocate. She's the founder and former CEO of Aki Diwa. I'm not sure if I'm pronouncing that correctly, but it's the Migrant Women's Network. Uh, has over 20 years experience of working with underrepresented groups, in particular women, children, the youth in Europe, Africa, and internationally. So almost every corner. Uh, Salome holds a master's degree in equality studies from UCD and is currently undertaking her doctorate. Hey guys, do you want to see a magic trick? I think we might need to mute a microphone there somewhere. I don't know, is everyone else hearing that? Yeah, well, we might uh, sort that out. I don't know that we need to see a magic trick today. I'm pretty sure that none of us believes in magic. Uh, <laughs> to continue with Salome, strong belief in equality and justice has shaped her career, leading to engagement with policymakers at national, European and international levels. There's so much more to her, but I don't want to take up any more of your time. And I would love you to give your best Zoom applause welcome to Dr. Salome Mbugwa. Thank you. Thank you so much, Ruth. Woo! Thank you, everyone. Uh, thank you, Humanist uh, Organization, because actually when you contacted me, it was my first time to get to know about your organization. And you're doing great things. And it's really very important for my organization, Akido, and even myself uh, to know that there's an organization that, like this one, uh, which we can work very closely with here in Ireland. Uh, so thank you. And thank you also to Rosianne, who have been communicating with me, mm -hmm. um, you know, since the time we started communicating. And it would have been good to meet physically, even though we are not able to do so. Just also to introduce myself very shortly, you know, my connection with Ireland, because I wasn't born in Ireland, but I've been in Ireland since 1994. I actually always say that, you know, the Holy Ghost Spirit brought me to Ireland, simply because I was baptized by an Irish priest from County Mayo as a child. And this Irish priest holds still so much um, 
of my journey, you know, in life and in, in what I have become today. Uh, Father Pato Tour from County Mayo, he worked in my uh, country in Kenya. I'm originally from Kenya for a long time. And, uh, you know, we didn't even have a church. We used to say masses in the house. And having those links, you know, adding up here in Ireland and me uh, being involved in what I do, I don't take it for granted. And uh, I actually am very happy to be here, to, to, to be led by that spirit, Holy Holy Ghost spirit of doing good uh, through for the part of two. So those are my connections with Ireland from the very time I was born. Uh, in my presentation to you, I'll talk about, mm. you know, my experience and my, my work on the area of racism in Ireland today. I will also actually give you a tip of what should what should the state do? You know, what are they not doing that they should be doing to tackle issues of racism and discrimination? What should you do, you yourself as an individual? By the time we finish this meeting, I might be able to help you to know maybe what you can do. I uh, to suggest, I'm only suggesting. And also, what can we do collaboratively, you know, with the humanist, with the kid, or with other groups and organizations? How what can we do to ensure that we are living in an integrated society, one in which everybody is treated with respect and dignity? Because that's what we are looking for. Going back to the story of George Floyd, and um, Aiden actually co commented on it at the beginning, you know, when we come to human rights, you know, we have all these human rights instruments, but human rights is very, very vital. Human rights actually is important in our lives. And when you look at George Floyd, the most important human rights principle that you can never take from anybody is the life. Uh, my name the, is Jashamia. The, the life of... Um, George Floyd was taken just like that. And this caused anger, it caused anguish, which ended up in Ireland. And why is this? You know, because we still have a structural kind of racism and systemic racism and racial discrimination itself. This is actually not new because Ireland was working on racism even before I actually um, came to live permanently in Ireland. And I see, for example, in 1998, I the see. then Minister for Justice, Mr. John Donoghue, um, opened uh, an organization called National Consultative Committee to address racism, which actually um, ended up supporting a lot of work and putting up laws into places. You know, it's tackling the issues of people like travelers uh, and other people who are, who are actually affected by racism itself. We also see Ireland going to Durban in South Africa in 2000, where the issues of racial discrimination were actually addressed. You know, Ireland most of the time, and I have had it since the, 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 the time of George Floyd, uh, you know, issues coming up and, and coming all the way to Ireland, people are, you know, demonstrating and there were a lot of uh, campaigns being held in places. People in Ireland would say that, you know, uh, Ireland was, had, doesn't actually hold all this, you know, the colonization, the slave trade, but actually the impact are there. And if you go to the research on how um, issues of colonization and slave trade are linked, you know, you, you find uh, um, some of the counties which you could actually uh, be able to source um, how the involvement was there, although it's not spoken about, but there are connections and, and issues there. Um, and so when we talk about actually, you know, the George Floyd and connection with Ireland and, and, and how that comes in, we see, you know, for years and years, there have been this, uh, kind of unequal distribution of power and deep inequality, you know, among people. If you look at it in America, you'd find that, for example, most uh, Africans are very poorly treated, you know, in terms of access to health, in terms of um, access to economic empowerment and all that. But you also see the way they are racial profiled, you know, and George Floyd was stopped and whatever happened, happened. And it's not only George Floyd in America, there were other, there are other people actually, other young uh, African men and women who have lost their life in, in, in very poor way or in very bad ways. And so if you link that to Ireland, you will find that the, what is happening in the 21st century, because you know, as we know Ireland, people used to come to go out of Ireland, but not come in, into Ireland. And I've been here since the, um, the, the booming of the economy, you know, in late 1990s, you know, and you found so many people actually coming in. So the diversity of people changed uh, completely and things um, have, changed quite a lot as, since that time. And so we have almost 600,000 of people from migrant background who are living in this country. Um, most of them, you know, coming to seek international protection, but some of them also coming as migrant workers. We have people who come as uh, spouses of those migrant workers as well, but you we also have people recently coming for the religious uh, purposes. Mm. So when I actually in Ireland in 1994, you know, and as, as a young African person coming here, I felt I was seen as a novelty, you know, people really wanted to touch my hair, to see me and all this. And 
although it was I came through college, it wasn't difficult to access things like banks, to access uh, anything that I wanted because the people didn't feel the threat there. I felt so at the time. And they then mentioned about the fear, the fear of unknown. People fear mm. when they see people that they don't know or they don't know where they're coming from. And also because of the, the role of the media and the stereotypes that have been reinforced through media about people coming in and in particular black, black people. So going back to the, the to, to the, the Durban conference that I mentioned in 2000, it was very much clear that the impact of colonization and um, slave trade continue to impact on black people wherever they go. So whether they're in America, whether they're in Europe, Australia, wherever they are, those impact of uh, colonization and slave trade impact on them and also the way um, the, the stereotype have been reinforced, you know, about these people continue to haunt them. And in 2015, all the government were asked by the United Nations to put measures into place to ensure that, you know, the cultures of people of African descent, for example, are recognized, uh, that they are helped and supported um, rather than actually being um, be naturally left out in you know when they try to access labor market or when they try to access other services and that actually con co we continue actually to do this and we continue to fight on this you know from the people of African descent group that we have here in Ireland. I remember actually during the, the early times of 2000 uh, I used to mobilize uh, African women there used to be churches in Moore Street for those who are from Dublin so there are these evangelical churches that had come up and we used to target women and talk to them on how they're going to talk in schools about issues of uh, diversity and embracing diversity in schools at the time. But there were still so many challenges and many women were complaining, for example, on how their children have been treated very badly, you know, in school. Uh, they were also talking about how they are treated very poorly when they're trying to access health. Um, and you know even including maternity hospitals and those kind of things so this kind of treatment it's so much linked into what uh, triggered the anger and anguish you know when people started demonstrating and they in the recent months you've had so many people talking about their experiences in particular young people as well this morning i was actually talking with a group uh, of young people from cork who have formed this group of Black Life Matters in Cork and talking about the challenges that they continue to face, um, which include profiling, you know, when, when they are stopped, if they are stopped actually by the Gadi, for example, if they are trying to access employment, because most of them actually can't get employment, or it's even very difficult for them to get into the, that level. Um, and this remain a, a huge problem. We also actually, I witnessed this, I, at the time I was in the board of the Equality Authority, that time we had not matched the Irish Human and the Equality Authority together. And there was a young man who was killed in Branchestown. The name of this boy, Toyosi, he was tapped several times. They had gone to play a match um, in, in Branchestown with friends. And he ended up being stabbed on Good Friday, uh, 2010. He was stabbed. And it was very terif terif terrifying, you know, for the boys, the young people who were with him. Um, the, the N word was used, you know, when he was being uh, approached and when he was being killed or when, when he was being stabbed. And when actually the police came, they ended up arresting the young people, you know, rather than actually supporting them. It has been, you know, a challenge, you know, to try and uh, understand on, on how we, people can be helped meaningfully rather without being um, victimized more or being put in, into victim. So these are some of the things that we've been working on, for example, in my own organization of trying to talk about uh, issues of discrimination and racism. We've done this work through research. We've carried a lot of research uh, on, for example, on how people try to struggle in getting into the, the labor market. The whole issue of housing is difficult, but it's still also a, a challenge um, in this. We've also seen it with our own politicians. You know, when politicians actually use a languages that uh, stereotype people more and pushes people more into more vulnerability. And we would see this actually, for example, in 2011, when the mayor of Nice said, said that you will not be representing black people because they are, you know, they are, they, they are, they are very loud and, and, and aggressive. He said actually that they are very aggressive and he will not actually be representing them. So we see this, you know, in public places, people being also targeted. Um, whether they're in buses or whether they are traveling. And so going back to the structural racism, because it's the key major one in Ireland, it's very systematic, systemic. And it goes back actually to, uh, to the level of individualism and also institutions. So institution actually, whether it's the policies that they have in place, whether it's the way they treat people when they go trying to access services, for example, in the hospitals, 
or in clinic that some people are treated very differently or you know they are not even um, treated very well when they're trying to access uh, those services and in terms of employment including actually a research that was uh, published in june this year uh, through the economic social institute of ireland it was actually uh, commissioned by the department of justice where well, they're trying to um to check in actually on the issues of integration in Ireland, it was very clear that in particular black people, um, and especially those who don't have the English language, continue to suffer in accessing the labor market. That accessing labor market is very difficult. And in Ireland, we also have what we call the employer bias. So the employer bias is the fact that you know, the employer can choose who to, to employ. Uh, and this is actually a, a problem because in Ireland, we, we have, um, what we also called public sector duty that some of the institution are not taking into account. Uh, we've also seen, you know, for example, in, in terms of institutional racism, and, and some people actually normally put the issues like people being in direct provision uh, and how they are treated, you know, as an issue as well, uh, and, and others, you know, that are there, the conditions which are in that. Uh, also, people feel so much excluded from the society, you know, at local, regional, and national level. They're excluded, actually, from planning of the activities that are going on within their own communities uh, and in the decision making as well. That in a country where we have 12 percent of the population as migrant that this uh, diversity should actually be reflected in uh, everything that we do so if it's activities which are set at community level we should actually try and ensure that we have uh, other people who are not in in among us you know and in fact the particular migrant in this case so we still have these big problems you know in particular the structural racism which i said you know sometimes very systemic you know it's the processes processes it's actually the policies that we have it's the treatment of people within the institution themselves which are many and we have actually tried to analyze them in my organization as well but we also have the experiences of individual racism of where people are treated very poorly uh you know it comes with the name calling when they're actually being abused or targeted. And the key major problem is that up to now, we do not have any way of supporting people who experience racism in Ireland. And it would be very important, actually, that, to, that we support other people. Uh, so, be, so because we have all this um, in, in our country today of the, the you know, the, the 12 percent of the migrants that has come, we feel that, you know, from, for example, from my organization and from my recommendation that I've been making to the government, that the government should come up with a holistic approach of um, addressing the whole issue of racism. And this actually should be from legal measure. Up to now, in our country, we use what we call the Incitement to Hatred Act of 1989, which is not effective. And so, you know, if somebody go to report of a case of racism, if the Gadi do not even know how to code it, you know, because you, you have to have a national uh, coding system. If they don't know how to code it, do not actually come up as, as racism. And we've had many problems, especially in the housing estate, where we've had a lot of uh, women having to move from one county to another. You know, women moving from Dublin to Galway because they've been actually been um, vandalized, you know, by young people uh, breaking into their houses uh, beating up their children and challenging them. And at the end, it's normally seen sometimes as antisocial behavior. So really in the country, we need a hate crime legislation or law or policy into place to be able to ensure that people are fully protected. Because it doesn't mean that if this family moves to Cork or Galway, it's going to be any better. But it's actually coming up with ways of how uh, people can live better together. So legal measures are very important and we really need as a matter of urgency the hate crime law in Ireland. Uh, Aiden spoke about education and education is very key. Education is not only for schools, it's not only for uh, for the curriculum that we have, but we need actually to have a curriculum that uh, take into account the diversity of the people that we have in Ireland as well. But it's also the education within the society of how do we live with different cultures and different people? How do we appreciate and, and actually embrace this diversity, which is now on our door? Uh, that it's very, very important, both in formal and formal education, take into account the whole idea of equality and issues of equality um, and, and tend to address uh, the issue of racism and how people can live together. The whole issue of data is also a problem because we don't have uh, sometimes, you know, 
the desegregated data that actually shows us, you know, is it young people, uh, which ethnic background, is it what, where, you know, from what area. So we didn't need uh, this data, which goes line in line with the reporting. The reporting mainly is done in Dublin, for example, we have in Ireland, which normally does the reporting. It's not everybody actually who report the, the incidence of racism. And again, it's because many people feel like there's nothing done. And also some people have had very, very bad experiences with Gadi when they got to report about issues of the racism. So they end up being asked, questioned about the immigration status and so many other things. So this is very, very difficult and, and challenging at the time. We also need to have a lot of monitoring, you know, to monitor on how the issues of racism are being handled and, and then the research to be able to inform what needs to be done. So that holistic approach has to be led by the government. And the government has to take the, the political will and leadership to ensure that, you know, the issue of racism is actually um, combated and, and, and addressed at this very, very early stage before we move into a, a situation where it's very, very difficult. Uh, I know, you know, in 2011, the public duty um, Act came into force, and and the, the the purpose of this equality duty act was actually to integrate the consideration of equality and good relations, you know, in our day to day life and what we do. But you will find that you know many, uh, like I was saying earlier, many institutions do not actually um, take. Uh, take actually this uh, public duty um, obligation very seriously, and so they do not actually um, try to get diverse, the, the, you know, diversity of people maybe in their workplace or when they are making policies, they do not even engage people from diverse background to be able to inform those policies. So our work in our institution has to be led or dictated by the diversity of people or the population of people that we have in the country. Um, I sit as a commissioner, you know, with the Irish Human Rights. And actually, we are national institutional body, so we are independent body, uh, although it's funded by the government. And we have the mandate to promote and protect human rights and equality, you know, for people living in Ireland. And with this, we have come up, you know, in Ireland with the, what we call the nine grounds, you know, that you cannot discriminate on. And this is one of them. So the others, you know, like disability, sexual orientation, and all that. We've been getting a lot of cases, you know, of discrimination, especially for people with the disability which is quite unfortunate and, and, and actually sad. We are also very conscious of the way travelers are treated uh, and for example, travelers accessing to houses um, and, and all those kind of things, you know. So we, we, when we actually talking about the government, you also have these independent bodies that are supposed to support and help uh, in the country, like the Irish human rights. We also have the, the Equality Act to 1998 to 2015 which actually aim to outro discrimination, you know, at places of work and also and when people are trying to access um, employment. Also, how do they advertise, for example, uh, when you're trying to access good uh, goods, uh, in, the, the, for example, the equality status, when people try to advertise for the houses, for example, and they give who should not apply for the houses or who, who, should, who should not even bother uh, to look into it. So we have some of these, um, instrument and these bodies that are helping uh, to promote equality and justice. But we still find that, you know, um, it, we still have a problem. It's also important to say that, you know, Ireland can actually change, can, can make the change very quickly because uh, we have people, okay, who have the problem you know, coming into the country and different people and the diversity in Ireland. But we also have very good people and uh, people who mean well uh, to, to ensure that things change and they change in, in, a, in a good way. Uh, so the commission has a, a unique role, you know, because you have legal powers that we can represent people. In recent time, we have actually been able to um, represent people living in direct provision for the right to work. So although this was discussed many times, the, the, the human right can come in and actually bring the, the human right obligation you know, that the, the state holds uh, to ensuring the, the human rights of people and, and many others. So it can intervene in case, uh, you know, people are having cases that need to be supported. Or also, if it's a, if it's a registration area um, that can, we can comment on. So it's important that, you know, uh, we work together and, and the state work together with other groups and organizations to be able to support this. Uh, but just to say that, you know, we cannot also leave everything to the state. 
all of us has a responsibility actually to be able to fight racism and discrimination. Because like I have said, you know, you would be in a bus traveling and a person has been called names or there's something happening there and you don't say anything. So what we can do collectively is that we can organize against racism all ourselves. We can actually establish allies. We can work together to combat racism as well. And like I was saying, you know, in Akito, we were trying to establish what we call the strategic alliance. So where are the humanists in this? Would you like to be part of a strategic alliance? I'm not saying that you join uh, the one that we are planning to, 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 to establish, but uh, how can you join uh, efforts, you know, with other organizations and groups that are trying to fight this issue? Um, because you know it makes changes when groups come together. We have, for example, since the seen the magic of the marriage equality, the pill, the aid amendment. You know all these groups which are coming together to form forces uh, to be able to bring change into the country. We also have to transform the society way of thinking. You know because you know the, the, the society has been fed with so much negativity. Or for example, uh, migrants, you know, asylum seekers, refugees, uh, migrants, uh, black people. So we really have to be able to transform the way the society thinks. And the way to transform is that it's raising awareness, but also it's engaging with these groups of people, you know, whether they are people with a disability, whether they are black people, whether they are uh, travelers, raising uh, awareness, engaging and dialoguing and embracing the diversity. And we've seen in recent time people coming up with different ways of doing that. Uh, it's either through festival, it's either through food, through music, but we really have to take steps to be able to do this collectively. So if you're organizing something, please make sure to look who is not on your, in, in that, um, in that thing which has been organized for. And if people have any problem of getting, reaching into groups or getting out to the groups, in Akido, for example, we would volunteer ourselves very much to connect people. In all the counties, we have con point of contact that we can connect people. So please look who is not into your table and bring people um, together to dialogue and engage. We also have to take leadership. You know, we don't have to wait for another person uh, to be able to do it. Uh, so in this, you know, as a group like humanists, you can you can come up with your own ideas of what you want to to do. You know, to be able to combat some of the problems, even if it's not actually racism. What other problem can you actually focus on you yourself as an organization and do it? In terms of what you can do as an individual, there's quite a lot you can do. Use your voice, call out racism. Your voice is very important. Most of the time we've seen people keeping quiet, you know, and when you keep quiet, it's like you comply with the wrong that is going on. So it's very important to use your voice and say, um, you know, you know, challenge what is uh, happening. Also, we have people who are in, in, uh, in position of influence. So use your influence. If you're in a leadership position, encourage diversity in meeting to discuss, you know, whatever is happening in the, in, in the workplace. If you're, you are the leader of a company, please try and bring the diversity in your company. You know, we've uh, again seen about this um, employer, bi employer bias, you know, that many employers don't want to bring people from outside because they don't know them. So there's the fear of unknown there. Also in your board, do you know, do you have people from the diversity, uh, different diversity or different walks of life? Because these people can come and talk to their members, you know, and people that are from their own uh, community. And also we have to start working for change. If you're not in a position of influence, you can connect a, 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 the person to a friend. Actually myself, I've been connected to so many friends. Even setting up an organization in this country, which will be 20 years next year, I've been connected from one person to another, you know, and going through the women's network in, in Ireland, actually, the women organization, you know, Waterford Women's Center, um, Clear Women's Network, Longford Women's Centers. I've been able to work with those organizations, but also other organizations which are there, you know, for the indigenous that can connect uh, people. And also connecting people with friends. You know, we've seen so many young people who, for example, want to be mentored, but they don't have anybody to support them or who need to be linked um, to support and services, but nobody who is able to, to link them. But if you know a friend who can help them, that would be very, very good as well. So you can use your influence in many ways. Uh, you can use your skills as well to mentor, uh, to support, and even to link up with organizations and groups that are there. Uh, and again, I would say in Nakido, we are very open to see that. So just to finish it, to say that, you know, the whole issue of racism in Ireland is a reality and it's a problem. I don't want to call it a big problem because it's a problem. And it's a problem that actually can be, um, 
you know, worked on, but it's only when people are uh, interested and people are committed to be able to do that. And I'm happy to see this uh, conference actually speaking on this issue because since the killing of George Floyd after June, um, the, the, so many people who are meeting have gone down and they don't actually address this area. But I'm happy that this area is, uh, this issue has been brought into your discussions and you're able to discuss this. So we'll be very much willing to work with you. It's a one way step forward. We've also had the government talking about uh, the establishment of the hate crime registration, which they are working on. They also have a committee which is working on anti-racism. This is the anti-racism committee. And so we are hoping that the government will come with a national action plan to address racism in Ireland. Uh, it's good uh, that uh, you know we also engage ourselves with what is happening. Many people do ask people for their experiences, but please remember when you ask people from experiences, especially people who are have been impacted by racism, you are triggering trauma for some of them. Um, and, and just to be aware of, 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 of how we engage with the different people who have been affected. I wanted actually to leave you with um, a quote from Nelson Mandela. And Nelson Mandela said that no one is born racist. And people, if people can learn how to hate, they can also be taught how to love. And so there's none of us who is born with hate. We are all one human race. And that's actually what should guide us in addressing racism in Ireland today. Thank you so much and thank you for having me. Thank you so much, Salome, Dr. Salome Mbugwa. That was fascinating and shocking and, and horrifying as well in some senses. I just want to mention we've had uh, some questions at the side, uh, at our little sidebar already, and just a reminder that if people have questions for the roundtable discussion, which will be happening later, please do post them into the chat function and we will bring them up then during the roundtable. But uh, Eyal Azule sent a couple of very important things there. He said, it's good to know some people in Ireland are teaching practical steps that we can take already to increase diversity in organizations. Karina Farke of Inspired Human presented at the Dublin Tech Summit virtual this week. Lots of ideas on her blog and he puts a link into it there. And he also says maybe just something, uh, Salome, for the back of your mind, although I've made a list myself. Um, he says, could Salome post a list of actions that ordinary people can take? And I mean, I made a list of things like use your voice, use your influence and your influencers in general meetings and in leadership roles, bring diversity in, work for change. If you're not in a position of leadership, find a way to invite diversity, link someone to resources, mentor and support. But maybe that's something that we, we may be able to get from you at a, at a later stage. Um, we also have a question as well in relation to, and I'll, I'll bring it in now, it's Roseanne, um, has said on bringing in a hate crime law and uh, Salome maybe you'd be okay to answer this now are these crimes currently prosecuted as assault and harassment uh, she goes on to ask then is one of the big problems that when these crimes are reported they are just dismissed if these crimes were taken seriously and fully investigated would that go a long way towards improving things I'd be concerned that Gardaí would waste time classifying things rather than successfully prosecuting people for assault and harassment. But I do understand that if these crimes are just now, just not being prosecuted, that we need a specific law. I know there's a lot there, but uh, if there was any of that, Salome, that you wanted to touch on? You're, you're muted there just yet, just. Hold on, sorry, I just got, can we, un, can you unmute yourself, Salome? Can you hear us? Yes, uh, yeah, thank you. Um, yeah, I, uh, I was actually just going to say that, you know, the incitement to hate redact is what has been applied now. That, that's what the, the, the law, the law that has been applied for a long time. Yeah, and it has been under the assault and all that. But if it's a case of, um, um, you know, racism, you know, because first of all, we need to define what is racism. So when they develop um, these laws, they have to have definitions of the actual, you know, the actual problem or the actual thing that has been examined in here. So there's racism and then there's racial discrimination. So we are hoping that, uh, you know, there will be better mechanism and better ways of uh, being able to prosecute people because also, like I told you earlier, most of these cases are put as antisocial behavior, which is actually not fair for the person. And most of the time also to say that the Gadi don't take it seriously. Uh, so we really need also to, um, ensure that you know this law enforcement uh, come into uh, you know force and it's actually followed uh, accordingly but also getting what the gadi are doing is uh, and we had asked before is to have uh, 
a, a contact person in every Gada station, you know, because some people, when they go to report anything, they are asked of so many other things which are irrelevant to what has taken them to the police station. So we also need to train the Gadi as well. And apart from that, we need Gadi from the ethnic background. You know, we need Gadi, Gadi people from ethnic minority who are in Gada force. And this will help quite a lot. But at the moment, the issue is still very, very problematic. The issues of reporting uh, uh, racism as, as, a, as a problem, it's still very problematic. Uh, as a country, we, we are not even near there to have people prosecuted properly for this. Thank you, uh, Salome. And uh, a comment as well at the side from Barbara Cullinan, who said, I've worked in a few of the direct provision centres, dreadful places, what we've allowed to happen to people. And that is something that you touched on as well. And, and again, if people have more questions for the roundtable that we're going to do after our next speaker, uh, we would appreciate if you would pop them in the, the comment box on the side there. Um, had another comment as well, Liz Bayfield said, very inspiring on, of, on the importance of using our skills and influence. So thanks to everyone who uh, sent us a message so far. And uh, I think now at this stage, we move on to our next speaker. Thank you again, Dr. Salome Mbugwa. Thank you so much. That was just fascinating. Um, our next speaker, and after that, we'll have a comfort break and then back for the, the round table. Matthew Collins of Hope Not Hate. And, and this is another fascinating speaker. And I just, I can't commend the organizing committee enough on the fabulous speakers today. Matthew Collins is a researcher for Hope Not Hate. Also manages their intelligence network. Um, he was previously a member of the British National Party. Now I'll be honest, when I read that initially when the mail went out, my head nearly exploded but he became a mole for the anti-fascist Searchlight magazine. He's been folks of two BBC documentaries, Life, etc. in 2001, and the BBC Three film, Dead Man Walking, which was released 2004. His autobiography is Hate, My Life in the British Far Right. I would love if you would give your best Zoom welcome with your jazz hands like this uh, for Matthew Collins of Hope Not Hate. Can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you now. All right, well, I'll, I'll, I'll begin. Thank you for inviting me to Cork. Uh, it's where my father's from, so I'm, I'm enjoying it. Um, I've, I've had to barricade the door to keep my children from doing a pitch invasion. Um, so if they do burst in, I apologise. They're reasonably well house-trained so far. Um, my father always says, before I speak in Ireland or to an Irish audience, I should apologise for being English. So apologies for that, although that's quite a hurtful thing, given that I've got Irish parents to have disowned me uh, after a certain period in my life, which of course uh, Ruth referred to in opening. So I'm going I'm to do a little bit about um, Irish, uh, the, the Irish far right. I'm not, I'm not the expert on it, and I, there's a lot of people in Ireland, of course, who are doing uh, terrific work on combating the Irish far right. There's many ways we can and we should combat the far right, and I think the position is now that. Ireland is probably just maybe 10 years behind, I guess, the UK in terms of how we combat the far right. The militant response previously was perfect, was excellent. It kept fascists out of city centres. It kept fascists out of public life. And unfortunately, we've moved to a position now in Ireland, of course, where that's not always possible. Although last week, of course, at the... Uh, <laughs> Last week, of course, at the GPO, we, we did see a militant response to fascist organising on the streets. And, and as an anti-fascist, I make no uh, apologies, and I think there should be no apologies, when fascists gather together for the purpose of intimidating others or, or, or gathering where there is a, a threat to people, people of colour or people whose uh, sexual orientation they don't like, there, there is always a risk to those people. And I think those that can uh, should organized to stop to stop this risk and, and stop this threat so but we are or you are in a position now perhaps where for the first time since the 1930s we're, we're seeing we're seeing in ireland organized organized fascism organized fascists confident and perhaps competent going into the streets and they're having a, a particular message on certain issues that people are listening to whether they're agreeing with them or not but people are listening to them and the one of the joys of course of social media particularly during a during a period of lockdown when we're all at home and the television is exhausted and even netflix has become rather boring 
is that people are searching the internet for things to occupy their time and of course we're in a position now where fewer and fewer people go to newspapers or entirely rely on news reports for news that comment and um, and facts and more and more people are drawn into what they call alternative truths which i, I believe uh, was coined perf coined perfectly by donald trump where if you don't like the answer or you don't like a truth or you don't like an analysis you just make up your own and let other people decide so moving you know the way that the fascists would like it is that we move to a period where things that they don't like you can just call them fake news and here is an alternative news and people are genuinely i think we're talking about people that perhaps don't have the maturity or or maybe even the education to understand that really things like news and facts they're not up for debate they're, you know we encourage people question what we see on television question what we read in newspapers but basically you should have the maturity and the intelligence to what you know to basically what is the crux of the story without comment and the problem is that many journalists now have become commentators and not news reporters so everything we get and of course with almost like the deregulation of media these opportunities have been thrown up to all kinds of people and we're talking primarily about conspiracy theory and conspiracy theorists and one of the very difficult things to to do i think first and foremost is is really clearly and accurately defined for a lot of people what fascism what fascism is there are five telltale signs of which four i can recall off the top of my head but to summarize it fascism normally um arrives or, or grows or or becomes infectious in times of a panic so fascism is a reaction to a panic when people feel they've lost control or people feel the control is out of their hands or they feel that the control or power is in the hands of people they don't like that they tend to panic um and i'll give you a, a an ex example of how conspiracy theories work my political life and career began over 30 years ago i know that's very difficult to believe because i'm very you know sort of svelte and, and, and young and um but there was a couple of really good conspiracy theories that i used to love pumping out to people when i was at school or in, in the streets the first one was that the holocaust was a lie and that was beneficial because there were so few holocaust survivors that we ever got to see or hear from which is a great shame because actually in the 1980s we had you know an abundance of people that could talk about their experiences but for some reason post-war in the uk uh, we mainly wanted to hear about heroic soldiers or heroic actions of, of of the british army or the allied army and we didn't really spend enough time understanding uh the lives of the victims of of racism and fascism and nazism and the other one i used to like putting out which reinforced the hatred of jewish people was that we shouldn't drink tap water because jews poison the water with fluoride i don't know i didn't know what fluoride was i know it's a, a toothpaste now but um we used to put these leaflets out and tell people now of course none of these holocaust deniers were back then and or, or any of these conspiracy theories they were conspiracies that we sort of dreamed up to get people to hate other people but last year uh, in, a, in a court case i was involved in there was a a, a young couple who I, who i won't name um Adam Thomas and Claudia Patatus, who were dedicated neo-Nazis. He was 21 years old, she was 39. So he was living the dream or she was living the dream. One of them was living the dream. And they had this baby and they called their baby Adolf Max. But then when it came to register the baby, they decided to make Adolf his middle name because they could always call him Ad Adolf throughout the rest of his happy and con constructive life. Now they spent a lot of time on the internet after having their baby looking how to buy crossbows and apparently shoot my colleagues and I with them. And what came out in, in the court case, they both went to prison, was that the, the young child, Max Adolf, had never been bathed in bath water. Now, I forget how old he was, I think he was six months, but in, in the six months he'd been born, he'd never had a bath, ever, not once. They'd used baby wipes on him or towels but they'd never bathed him in water. And the reason they didn't bathe him in water is because Jews poisoned the water supply. When I was asked, when I was asked by that, what, did, what do you think about that? The only thing I could think of was, oh, you're not supposed to actually believe the conspiracy theory yourself. 
everybody else is meant to believe the conspiracy theory. And we're at a point now, I guess, where conspiracy theory in difficult times, like fascism, like in panic, are a explanation for how things happen that we have no control on. And in particular, what pleases particular sort of people when science fails, when there is a failure of science, when science can't bring uh, the solution or, or, or the answer. The only previous time I could think of when so many people took so much delight in the failure of science was when HIV and AIDS first, first came out and the scientists couldn't find a, a cure for it and still can't find a cure for it, which surprised, uh, you might have seen it, surprised Donald Trump the other week. He thought there was a cure for AIDS and he'd taken it and he discovered that th there is still no cure for it. He was quite surprised by that. And that was by, let me describe them as, as sort of right-wing Christian fundamentalists. Because science couldn't get the answer to it, that was proof that AIDS was a, well, for them, a gift from God to punish gay people. And the only other time since then that seems to have ignited this same sort of fury and passion has been the COVID outbreak, because there's no cure to it. And, and how this has been portrayed is, Either it's not a punishment from God because it just simply doesn't exist, or secondly, it is a punishment from God or a punishment from the Chinese because the communists are omnipresent and, and everywhere. And thirdly, it's being used to control us. So COVID is, and this is, I've seen this more prevalent in, in Ireland than I have in the UK, the idea that COVID is actually being used to erode our, free, our freedoms. You know, Please stay indoors, don't go to the pub, do not spread the virus. And immediately we see people who see that as like a red rag to a ball. So they're not wearing their mask and they're deliberately going out and mixing. And of course, they, they are spreading uh, they are spreading a disease and, it, and it's dangerous. But I, I'll come on to uh, a few other things because I did make some, make some notes while I was uh, looking after my, my, uh, my children today. One of the quite astonishing things, I, I think, about the rise of the far right in, in Ireland has been uh, how active, not so much on campus, but how active in university circles uh, organized fascists have become. And one of the things about fascists, of course, is that they don't necessarily always agree that they are fascists. And the anomaly in probably only Ireland and a few other countries is that um, people don't tend to mind people describe themselves as Irish nationalists in, in Ireland. But elsewhere around the world, you know, French nationalists, German nationalists, British nationalists, you tend to get the picture that these people who, who are fascists. But Ireland, of course, you know, the nationalism you see in Ireland has a different interpretation and also uh, quite different connotations. And I want to uh, quote. I, you know, I want to, I want to quote from uh, a fascist publication that was put out the other day in, a, in an online newspaper called the Burkean. Burkean. And it was named after Edmund Burke. And I was discussing this with my missus and she didn't even know that Edmund Burke was Irish. And then she later admitted she didn't actually know who Edmund Burke and it was anyway. And he was the person who said, the only thing necessary for the triumph of evil is for good men to do, is for good men to do nothing. And of course, that talks about, encapsulates this idea of a panic that nothing is being done when something should be should be done. And so it was a wise, a very wise choice uh, by, by these young fascists to do it. Irish fascism hasn't really uh, had great numbers or great pull or great tech or traction since the 1930s when uh, Owen, Owen Duffy was the head of the police and then he went off to Spain to join, you know, to join Franco fighting communism. And then the, the Irish blue shirts came home sunburnt, complaining that they couldn't get a pint of Guinness and that the weather was very, very hot and the food wasn't very pleasant. Pleased to report you still can't get a decent pint of Guinness in, in Spain, but the food is, is, is very different. So we have these students who are writing in this uh, Burkean magazine. And what we are particularly seeing in terms of Irish nationalism and understanding Irish nationalism and those who would use Irish nationalism for the non-progressive uh, politics is how these particularly young people tackle the idea about the, the Irish national question, tackle the idea about a united Ireland. And as someone who lives in, in the UK, I, I, I'm fairly certain that we are going to see 
a united island for a number of reasons i think our government's incompetence the fact that british people really still don't understand why we have this small part of your country attached to ours the fact that your football teams aren't particularly good so we don't really want a northern ireland and a scotland and a wales as, as part of our football associations but the other thing of course that traditionally has kept the fascists out of the national question has been their relationship to duffy and ergo uh, michael michael collins previously and that's always been a, a a sort of battering ram that the progressive nationalists or the republican socialists have always used to batter down fascists it was that in the in the interests of irish nationalism or in the interests of the irish national question that that a progressive nationalism was already at work uh in, in whichever guy or progressive or not and also the irish nationalism had an internationalist flavor that Sinn fein and other and other parties on, on the left who in, engaged in irish republicanism sought to align themselves with progressive causes particularly causes in africa or in asia or in south america where traditionally your irish fascists would have no no cause and no sway and it kept them out of that question and what i've seen in the burkean 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 is how people sort of born after the good friday agreement or people still very very young probably too young to remember bombs and bullets and when the relationship and an all island relationship was probably very much impossible is how they now want to define the irish question them, themselves and this is from the burkean which of course i uh <clears throat> this is it and this is a this is a young a, a young person right and i assume it's I'm, I'm assuming it's a young man it's a really 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 long article it's got lots of really long words that don't always make sense which is another factor about fascism it's all about long words and long sentences and not particularly great common sense so quote there is i think among ireland's newer nationalists that's young people a certain sentimentality surrounding Sinn Féin and the provisional ira the backlight of history has cast larger than life silhouettes of them as rebels with a cause we are enamored with their unbroken traditions and unbending principles and how when belfast was burning they sprung to the defense of their communities men like billy mckee in the battle of st matthews battered and bleeding like brugger before him inspire us yet as modern ireland quickens its descent into post gaelic political decrenitude using nationalists are left vote young nationalists are left wondering where the boys of the old brigade have gone. The flood of perverse progressive ideologies from critical race to queer theory serve not to unite, but to anatomize under the auspice of diversity, divide and conquer by a different name. All these ideologies are then given generous donations and complete corporate sponsorship. So that's how the modern Irish uh, fascist wants to address the ongoing uh, national question, which is basically, uh, although United Ireland is preferable, there's no point having a United Ireland when both sides of, of the borders have in, in, increasing diversity. And if you want to see uh, non-diversity in action, that's just you go to South Belfast occasionally and see how that plays out. Anyway, it goes on, blah, 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 blah. The death of Ireland is already dying because of increasing LGBT rights, um, uh, queers, Africans, etc., etc., etc. So the growth of the Irish far right has been accelerated by a number of key issues, and what we've seen since uh, same-sex marriage and the legalisation of abortion in the Republic of Ireland are two particular sets or sects uh, coming coming together. They don't necessarily always agree. But they come together in this panic and it's a panic about of course the loss of loss of identity mainly for the religious right it's the growing separation between church and church and state and for the others of course it's the increasing it's the increasing diversity it, it's the, it's the promotion of things that neither are particularly keen on for your traditional fascist never been particularly keen on lgbt rights uh, and although fascists have a often difficult and skewed relationship with the church definitely they feel that they would rather be ruled by 
a leader who is closer to God than ordinary men and women. And a lot of this sounds very, very strange, but when you spend time amongst people, you would see how to them it, make, it makes perfect sense. So it's been ex ex so the growth of the Irish Far Eye has been accelerated by the, these two key issues, and it's wedded the, the groups. Um, there's also an increase, you might have noticed, in anti-communist rhetoric. And I think for, for communists, this is always quite interesting because the communist parties aren't particularly growing at great pace, but they seem to have, even without uh, doing it, uh, an, inanimate, an inanimate amount of influence they were particularly unaware of. And so your T-shirt and all the, all, the, all the other senior politicians in this country who uh, are part of this, this, this problem, this, this great uh, traitorous uh, government and, it, and its allies, are seen as communists or they're seen as Marxists or they're part of a school which is called cultural Marxism. Now cultural Marxists are um, anyone from your T-shirt to Boris Johnson to the Queen of England, the French Prime Minister, some of the most right-wing people in, in, in European politics, are, although they're conservative but they're also classed as Marxists because they oversee this growing and changing agenda. agenda. LGBT rights, for instance, uh, diversity, free movement across uh, free movement across Europe. These things are all seen as as things that feed into this conspiracy, the traitorous elite. Um, now, the the whole thing about conspiracy theory is, is is really interesting. What is the conspiracy theory? What can you put your your finger on? And I did touch on it. A little bit before but the conspiracy theory is again in the absence of science where science falls down and this is particular in in democratic countries that follow science so we're, we're guided by you know we're guided by doctors not by priests or we're guided by teachers uh, and, and not other you know not not other people so when we want to when we want to know why, when we want to know why it thunders and rains and why there's lightning, you know, the answer is scientific. It's not. It's not. It's not religious. Um, and so when these fall down, people believe that the fall down in society is down to secret societies, other than the church, which isn't a secret society. So they become secret forces, which tend to be led by paedophiles and 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 Jewish blood libels. Someone recently, I forget who it was, said, you can, you can tell a fascist in, in Ireland because they're shouting paedophiles at everyone but the church. The growing conspiracy we're, we're seeing now in Ireland and Britain and in America is this idea that there is a, a global paedophile network, um, which is basically what social services are, that are stealing, which are, that are stealing children. Um, and, you know, Jeffrey Epstein, of course, was one was one example. So that fed him well because he was he was Jewish and he was a paedophile. So he was part of this uh, secret network. The British royal family were part of this this network, and this network has a place. It meets in pizza parlors. You remember Pizzagate during the last American election? There was actually a shooting in a pizza shop in Washington D.C. because the rumor had gone around. It was it was where it was where Hillary Clinton was meeting with her paedophile friends. And so some outraged person who hates paedophiles, who believed the sort of nonsense they read on the internet, uh, went to this particular pizza uh, shop and started shooting people. So it's, it centers around Jewish identities, secret societies, and they're all involved in all of this global elite. Now, the only thing that uh, is mildly amusing, of course, when uh, Prince Andrew was accused or of being involved with Jeff Jeffrey Epstein's uh, paedophilism in his uh, in his alibi that he wasn't involved at this uh, sex party with children. He actually said he was in Pizza Express in Woken, um, which people just said furthermore, furthermore evidence that it's pizza shops and paedophiles uh, working to working together. Now, the Irish far right is closely. Um, Probably, probably more than in, in the UK, but about probably on par, I, I guess, with the Italians and some of, some of the other Latin nations, Spain as well, really, really tied into the idea that the, the church is the law, that it's a, it's a clerical law that, that, must be, that must be obeyed. And churches have a, a broad sway uh, right across them of progressive uh, sects or, or 
progressive um, parts of it, each church. And uh, you can bet your life that the Irish far right is particularly mainly uh, more interested in the 19th century uh, Irish church than it is in the, in the, in the modern, I modern Irish church. So on the, point, on the point of science, the far right tend to use silence, science only to further corrupt uh, broken ideas. In Ireland, because of the close relationship they have with religious ideas, you get considerably less ideas about eugenics. The Nazis used eugenics to talk about a superior race and superior human being. It was used as an excuse, and is still used as an excuse, to deal with what they call lazy eaters, which is doing away with disabled people, or generally people who can't or don't or won't or won't work are called lazy eaters. And generally, in, in sort of the modern Nazi eugenics, which, which we have in the United Kingdom, but not so much in Ireland, uh, is the idea, again, although they're against abortion, they believe it's necessary to do to people who will become lazy eaters and slow the and and, and slow the uh, and, and slow like the growth of the superior being and super, superior race down. So, the Irish the Irish far right is growing. It's becoming increasingly more noticeable. One of the reasons it's become more noticeable is because it has quite, I wouldn't say charismatic leaders, it has quite odd and challenging leaders. I think that's a polite way to, to describe them. And there are four basic individuals or, or movements, potentially more, I guess, who have, particularly during COVID, have come together as, let's say, fishermen or fisherwomen in, a, in what is quite a small pond um, to sort of fish and try and establish themselves as these, you know, who will lead Ireland into this, you know, into this new, you know, this new dawn that, that they see. Many of you will know uh, Justin Barrett. Yes, thumbs up or thumbs down, but you know Justin Barrett. Um, Justin Barrett uh, obviously made his name uh, in the 1980s, he you know, he was a he was a fervent anti-abortionist. He was he campaigned against gay rights, campaigned against divorce until he got a divorce, and that was okay. Uh, traveled all over, traveled all over Europe, uh, speaking with with Nazi groups. He is, I I would say, if in international terms, probably the person on the on the Irish far right who is, you know, a national you know, a national socialist. Would describe himself as, as a nationalist. But he's formed his organisation and has worked very, very closely with some British national socialists and, and fascists. His party is most, most closely uh, sort of uh, built along the lines of a traditional fascist party. He's a leader. He has a deputy. He has active branches. He, regu he regularly addresses, he regularly, uh, addresses his, his, his troops. Um, We've got the Irish Freedom Party led by Herman Kelly, who was very, very active in the United Kingdom Independence Party uh, and formerly the Irish Catholic newspaper. Um, the Yellow Vests, which again, this is a, a copy we saw in England two years ago, which is almost like a, a do it yourself movement, which comes off the internet. So when people start grifting or putting themselves on YouTube, giving their thoughts on the day, again, all conspiracies. The yellow vests formed. They copy what happened in France when the yellow vests were on the streets rioting. The, the idea being that there are so many things out of the, the grasp, out of control, political, social, politically, socially, and otherwise, from ordinary people, that they can don yellow vests and meet and congregate and share a whole width and breadth of, of ideas that aren't always particularly not progressive. And one of the things about the yellow vests, both in Britain and in Ireland and other countries where they've mimicked what happened in France is that there's a number of people who get drawn into a movement like that who have real genuine concerns and often they are people who have been dealt very very real and harsh realities by society very very real lessons about uh, how difficult it is to get like a fair and equal access to law uh, to, to legal advice how very very difficult it, it can be 
to get access to housing, how very difficult it can be to get your children into the right school. And some of these concerns that these people have that drive them onto the internet for solutions and then drive them onto the streets are things that progressive people can often find very, very difficult to tackle because these are often people who want very, very quick and short answers and solutions to their problems. And if you're a housing officer, for instance, and you have to explain to someone why there is a housing shortage and why you may see people of color who don't have Irish accents or they don't have white faces, how you can see that they have access to homes and you don't, you're a housing officer, you would have to spend perhaps hours explaining these difficult and complex processes to someone when all they want is a quick answer and the quick answer in the modern day and age if you don't like something you go onto the internet and you find someone who's saying what you do want to hear or you find someone giving very very simple answers to very very complex questions there's a housing shortage and a housing short a housing crisis in ireland and very very similar we're seeing very much the same thing in, in britain and we're seeing a narrative in britain that uh, returning soldiers from wars they've been sent to that no one was asked if they wanted to go to are coming home and they're finding themselves traumatized suffering from mental issues finding that they can't get houses that they were never promised but which are guaranteed to them or almost guaranteed them when they come home they have to be housed they're not getting them we're seeing increasing numbers of, of people being housed who are also entitled to it but it's such a complex mix and if you're viewing this as someone under pressure, under duress, without access to law, without access to redress problematic things in your life, the simple answers and solutions that come from people on the internet who can give you a conspiracy theory are actually, whether they're far easier to believe or not, it doesn't matter. They're far easier to palate, they're far easier to swallow, they're far easier to understand. And so the Yellow Vest movement, although it was almost autonomous, uh, very, very quickly has, has found itself now uh, close to the National Party, almost now dominated by the National Party, because there's a man with a history of saying very, very silly, but very, very palatable things to minds that want, want to hear things. And people say, how do we tackle this? Well, there's no easy way, actually, to tackle it. One of the things is that fascism always turns in on itself and ends up devouring itself, but it, it spits people out who end up in all kinds of different states and conditions on issues like housing and other difficult issues that challenge people and we're always talking about working class people we're always talking about people here who don't have uh, great access to skill sets and uh, and other apparatus in society that helps people get through is that we just have to keep first of all challenging the lie second of all challenge you know a honest narrative we mustn't answer lies with lies. Sometimes we have to take it on the chin, but we keep coming back about what we believe, about what we know, and about what we can prove. Difficult to prove something when you can just have alternative facts, I know. But we, we, stick, with, you know, we stick with those things. Probably my favorite, you shouldn't have favorite fascists, I, I know. And I don't even think, like a lot of fascists, she even realizes she is a, a fascist or bordering on fascism is Gemma Doherty. Now, as I understand it, she used to be a very uh, competent and highly regarded journalist who spent her time exposing inequalities or injustice or corruption. And I don't know uh, what happened to Gemma Doherty, but she was, she is perpetrating this anti-vaccine myth that vaccines are deadly it's an anti you know it's an anti-science thing isn't it these vaccines uh, will harm and kill your children and they are they are competent enough to find an absolutely obscure scientist who can prove their obscure fact so 99.9 percent .9 of uh, scientists say there's no harm from vaccines yes but what about this this individual i i found and then they cling they cling to that. Is it because people are scared of injections? I don't know. But further to that now, the people that run Facebook have begun deleting far-right haters uh, off Facebook. And so now Facebook are part of this secret society of treacherous individuals. And vaccines now 
will insert a chip into you so Facebook knows what you're, you're doing all day. Does it seem believable? You'd be surprised at how many people it does. 5G phone masks. We have people burning down 5G phone masks because they spread coronavirus. We also have people now saying there is no coronavirus. So those are the, the, the sort, of our, sort of arguments we're seeing. And it's about, first of all, people, people not having the maturity and the skills to answer and understand difficult questions and situations. We have a lot of people here who we are described as grifters working away in Ireland with ultra-religious and ultra-right agendas. And we also have challenging times for a lot of Irish people about the history and the future of your country. I finished there because I'm being hurried up. I do apologise. Matthew, thank you so much. Let's, let's give him a, a Humanist Association of Ireland round of applause. Another fascinating presentation and I can tell you the questions were flying in as you were talking there. So what we're going to do at this stage um, is we're going to take a comfort break. We've gone a little bit over on time just because we started a little bit late. We're going to take 10 minutes instead of 15 so you'll have time to boil the kettle. Then we're going to come back which would be let's say we'll take 12 minutes and that would bring us on to six to uh, four twenty. Is that okay for everyone? Yeah, thumbs up. Gives us 12 minutes and in the meantime please feel free to put any questions you have in the group chat there. And off you pop and make a cup of for yourselves and we'll see you back here very shortly. Thank you, everybody. At this point, we took a break for 15 minutes or so before moving on to a roundtable discussion chaired by Ruth Scott. However, before that, we had a reflection from Tom Woolley of the Irish Freethinkers and Humanists. Right, I just want to make a few comments um, that might be useful. Um, what I thought might be worth suggesting is that I think people should discuss what I call everyday racism, because we've heard some pretty significant stuff about uh, policies and, and uh, the, the lack of uh, police action and, and so on, and also about all these lunatic groups. But uh, what, um, one of the things I've noticed recently in co having conversations with perfectly nice people that I come across is that people are using this expression, white lives matter. They say, oh yes, that, that black lives matter. Oh, but I think that, you know, we should really talk about how white lives matter. And that's become really quite common currency recently. And I wonder, you know, how it, it, it's, it, everyday racism is about a sort of culture which has developed recently in which it's okay to be racist. So uh, little things that have happened in Northern Ireland, like 2016, there was a black woman stopped at the Belfast City Airport. People remember that because they, uh, an immigration officer thought she looked foreign. Um, so she managed to get £2,000 compensation out of the, somebody, or I don't know who paid the compensation, but um, it's, um, uh, and you, you get this kind of stuff that goes on all the time, which I think people turn a bit of a blind eye to. And, and so I think it's important perhaps to discuss uh, some of that aspect. How, how does it affect us, particularly as humanists, in, in terms of our everyday life? I mean, I, I'm, my own particular expertise and field is I, I'm an architect and I'm involved in <coughs> building materials and I've been doing some work with the, the Grenfell survivors. Uh, and Grenfell is an issue about using horrible, toxic, flammable insulation material, m much of which is made in Ireland, by the way. Um, and imported from China. But um, it, it's not a, just about the technical issues, the insulation, it's the, the racist way in which the people who died and were treated following Grenfell uh, has been treated by the system. So a, a leading company, which is particularly big in Ireland, is being sued by the Grenfell survivors because they tried to say it wasn't their insulation that burned on Grenfell. It was, it was the fault of the people themselves in the flats and how they live their lives. Now that, that is what I call everyday racism. It's like, it's not obviously racist. You can listen to it and you think, oh yes, yes, white lives matter. So I think, I think that's one of the things I feel people should talk, should discuss is what are the sorts of things that go on on a sort of day-to-day -day basis and how can we challenge it. And of course, because I live in Northern Ireland, the other thing is the fact that sectarianism provides a wonderful breeding ground for racism. 
um, and uh, I certainly come across that quite a lot. So <clears throat> those are just a few thoughts maybe to get, get a discussion going. So I hope that was useful. Certainly was. Thank you very much for that, Tom. And again, oh, and I, I, I forgot to you. say, I've got my Rock Against Racism badge on here. This is to prove that I was out there uh, with in the streets with Billy Bragg a long time ago in London. Oh, brilliant, brilliant. Thank you so much, uh, uh, um, Tom. And uh, it's funny, we'll, we'll start the round table discussion now. It's funny, I was just looking at my emails there and I, I signed up to uh, the American humanist organization and I just saw an email this second saying uh, they're calling on all the American humans saying can you add your voice today by calling your senators and demanding they don't appoint Judge Barrett to the Supreme Court as Ruth Bader Ginsburg's replacement uh, the point being that she's crossed the line of separation of church and state uh, and actually Eamon maybe do you want to mention the upcoming event with the American humanists it might be a good time to drop it in here yeah I guess with that in mind thanks Ruth um, just a date for the diary for everybody on Tuesday, November the 10th. Um, our national level, so to speak, uh, Humanist Association meeting via Zoom, of course, as, as is necessary, will uh, feature two special guests. Uh, the first is uh, Carrie Shaw, who is the coordinator of the Fairfield Connecticut Humanist Association. And um, Roy Speckhart, who is the chief executive of the American Humanist Association. Um, so they're going to be on with us on Tuesday, November 10th. Uh, those of you following the American election might know that that's exactly one week after the presidential election. So the main bulk of the conversation will surround the results of that election, whatever that happens to be, and what are the implications for humanists and secularists in America post um, <laughs> well, uh, I'm sure most people in the virtual room here will be keeping their fingers crossed. Uh, Post-Trump will be the, uh, the theme, but, you know, who knows? There are a lot of possible outcomes, including an uncertain result. So, well, Eamon, uh, Eamon I, I want to say that I'm delighted we're having the Americans uh, to see a different point of view. And uh, of course, I would like to vote a hundred times for Biden, but I'm restricted because my vote, vote comes in the post and as Donald Trump does not know, the post is sacrosanct. And in 52 years, I've never missed an election. So I think that's a good <laughs> record for the US post. Thank uh, you, Francesca. And, and what's more, we, if you were to vote several times, we'd have to report you for voter fraud. <laughs> so thank you for that. Uh, a reminder that at this stage, uh, we're going to welcome back our two phenomenal speakers today. Uh, we have Salome Mbugwa, Dr. Salome Mbugwa, and we have uh, uh, from Hope Not Hate, Matthew Collins. So we're delighted to welcome you back again to our round table. Look, I, I'm going to start with, there's been a lot of great questions coming in on the side, and feel free to add in any questions at any point. Um, it certainly seems easier than maybe opening up 55 microphones at the one time. Barbara, Eilish, Roseanne, a lot of people have asked the question for Matthew directly. So if it's okay to start with you, how did you come to join the British National Party? And then equally people wondering what, may, what was the reason that your stance changed? What, was there a support that had you turn away from fascism? Oh, you're muted there, Matthew. Can you, uh, can you unmute yourself there, Matthew? Yeah. yeah. It's an old book, but you can still buy it. And I get 22 pence from Amazon. So I could probably get a pint out of all of you if you all bought a copy. <laughs> um, okay, uh, I joined the National Front when I was 14, 15, uh, and then sort of graduated onto the BNP because the National Front went into decline. The reasons I've joined are as interchangeable and complex, depending on how I feel on the day when I'm talking about it. Um, I don't know. I think the, the reason I joined was I was a, a young, white, working class boy brought up in South London with three brothers on a council estate. My father left home early. He did that. I'm popping out for a loaf of bread and never came home. And uh, I was very, very bitter and resentful. And there is a narrative that people use who get sucked into far right extremism that they were they were groomed, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. I have to say that wasn't the case with me. I developed really, really strong racist ideas about my neighbors or people I went to school with, and I followed through on them and ended up in the National Front, 
where I was employed full time by them. Then I went to the BNP, then Combat 18 and hung around with the UDA and all things like that. The reason I left, uh, they always uh, want you to talk about this road to Damascus moment or a particular moment. Uh, uh, the one that we always talk about, and I, and I think it was pivotal, but it wasn't the only uh, particular thing, was there was a, um, we attacked a, a meeting in 1989 or 1990, I'm getting old, I can't remember, um, where we really did quite extreme violence to people. I'd been involved in punch-ups and had uh, yeah, been involved in, in tear-ups. But um, what, having witnessed that um, with people, you know, such innocence, I think 17 people were hospitalized after it. I remember a woman uh, jumped through a, a window onto the pavement outside to escape it. I just began to think um, I'm probably on the wrong side. And I'd, I'd, I'd often wondered, you know, it, other than like the really extreme racism, which I, you know, I, I held I like had extreme racist views. Um, uh, other than that, would I would I've been on would I've been on the other side? I also saw very much when I was was very young and growing up. I also saw um, what well, I I sort of felt because I was poor and I was white that I was excluded from a lot of things. And to be honest, I saw some of some of like the anti-racist work or how I interpreted it that was being done in schools tackling racism. I always felt that was an affront, and I always felt it excluded white people. So I had a, a, a considerable amount of issues, basically being white and poor and a little bit stupid. And I think, again, having, you know, I, I drew conclusions about society and life and, and how I lived and where I fitted in with it that were wrong and went unchallenged, certainly not competently challenged. And then as I, as I moved through it and saw all these, all, all the things that happened, uh, just a number of things began to um, unravel. I got I developed a wanderlust. I wanted to go and travel. I wanted to see the world, and I just gra I just gradually grew out of it. And getting a girlfriend helped. Uh, I got to be honest, that really helped. But just generally, I think now I, I passed through it. I experienced really, really bad uh, hatred about people I didn't know and didn't know anything about. And then I moved through it. I saw everything. I experienced everything there was to experience about racism and hatred and Nazism and fascism. And then I came out the other end and I just thought well, that wasn't very nice and that wasn't very pleasant. Um, and I, I often wish it hadn't, I hadn't have, uh, personally experienced it, but, but I did. And that's the, that's the short answer to it. And that's the pop psychology. My missus is training to be a psychologist that she often uh, uses on me. Thank you, Matthew. I'm wondering, is that what you talked about there is, would you see that reflected in many of your, let's call them former fascist friends colleagues um yeah I, I i think so i think the nature of fascism has, has changed um in britain as well it had a period of extreme popularity a, a million a million votes in 2009 a million people voted for a political party that basically in its manifesto uh wanted to deport people who were non-white but wanted to set up uh, work camps that didn't believe the whole, that said that they were going to remove Holocaust education because Holocaust was a lie. So that, you know, the nature of people who've been sucked into it has changed drastically. I joined far right when it was tiny, minuscule, insecure, but that didn't mean for one moment Britain was a non-racist society by any stretch of the imagination. But you know, I, I made a few stupid decisions in my life and that was the first of many. Okay. Um, I Al Azule has kindly sent several links, actually, and thank you for this. In just before the break, uh, was talking about combating fake news by sharing fact-checking resources, and uh, he sent the link. And again, you'll get it in the, this group chat along the side to the journal, the online newspaper that do fact-checking. Um, and thanks for that. It's it's a good reminder. And uh, for the sillier things, there's Snopes, S N O P E S. Yeah, brilliant. A good way of, uh, of you know those awful messages you've got sent around about. For instance, COVID saying if you touch a petrol station pump, you're going to get it and get sick. Salome, um, I'll come to you at this stage. Um, Teresa is one of the people who has sent in a question in relation to racism and intolerance. She said, 
Children become aware of different colours and backgrounds in primary school during religion class. Some primary teachers in Catholic schools have to send some children outside the room during daily prayers and the first communion prep class without any, in, without any vocal indoctrination. They learn about them and us. As Irish humanists, we must work tirelessly for a secular education for all. What are your thoughts on this as a way of maybe helping us climb out of the, uh, the, the cycle that we're in and not representing, as you say, 12% of the, the population of Ireland, which is a migrant population? Yeah, thank you. Thank you so much, Ruth. I think, uh, you know, it comes back to the role of education and where I, I actually emphasized that education in terms of informal education. So this is at the community level, but also education in formal systems. And uh, I remember actually when I was not, not very new in Ireland back in 1998, 1999, because I wanted to engage and I engaged with the Offre Child Care Committee because I, I live in Offre as well. And at the time, um, you know, and, and I was in the um, Equality Authority as well uh, during the time of 2007, and it was very clear that one in five children were of mixed race, for example. So they are children who are born between, you know, um, maybe from a black person and, a, and an indigenous Irish person. And this was the reality of the crutches. And we still see that actually in most of our schools. But apart from that, we have so many children who have been born here. And so they're Irish citizens, most of them, uh, um, until the citizenship referendum was actually carried out or it was changed. But you'll find that, you know, these children are born here and sometimes they would be made to feel like they are not Irish or they don't belong. And also children are struggling with the whole issue of identity. But going back to what can be done, you know, because we, we still see that even in these um, um, very early learnings, you know, the whole issue of uh, children seeing other children different can occur. And this is actually because of what has been discussed at home, because a parent might discuss or family might discuss about uh, differences, you know, without noting that children are noting into what is happening. So it's the discussions that we hold in our own families. It's the discussions that we hold within our own communities, you know, about other people. That these children remember, and going back to Mandela, uh, nobody who is born with hate, you know, people run to, to hate, but if they run to hate, they can also be taught how to love. And so we have to be very conscious, you know, at all levels. And so going back to the Offre Child Care Committee, we came up with a kind of a training, you know, diversity in early, early learnings, you know, so what can be done and what should people be prepared for? And it was very clear that, you know, we have to start with the educators of uh, the, the, the very early learning, you know, in the crutches and what is happening within the crutches to be able to bring diversity in those crutches, you know, because for example, we had children from the Muslim community who would not eat ham sandwich you know or anything to do with the pork and most of these people don't understand that there were also other understanding of the hair and the way the children interact and also the learning materials that are being brought or they are being given to these children to learn. So this is all very important. And really the whole issue, I cannot emphasize enough that it's all our responsibility. The responsibility in terms of the way we have communication and we engage with con in conversations, you know, and talking about other people and what children get out of that, because children are able to adapt very quickly. So the early learning training and education is very important in actually embracing diversity and encouraging children to, to see everybody equally and to love everybody equally, regardless of their religion, regardless of their color, or regardless of where they are coming from. You've seen with the Black Lives Matters how many young people, even born in this country, are coming out to speak about their experiences in schools, you know, which has been very, very bad. We also had problems, you remember, in early 2000, where the, the schools could not take many people. And actually, we ended up with what we call the Educate Together Now. You know, these schools being established to be able to accommodate children who could not fit in other school because also schools had the right to give preference because of the religious ethos and all that. But th this, is, this has all changed now at the moment. But uh, what I'm saying is that, you know, the changes are with us. We hold these changes in our hands. And it's the way we communicate. It's the way we interact, even with the children from very, very early ages. So the teachers can do very much in the crutch, but also these children go back. So we can say children are not racist, they don't see these things, but they hear them from their parents, from their family, and from all that. It's just to be conscious and to be aware on how we can approach these things. Thank you, Salome. Uh, it's something that I, I've observed from both of our speakers today is the idea of the feeling of not belonging, in a sense. And I want to touch on something, and Salome, I might come to you first. 
the idea of being able to see yourself. So I don't know if, if people are the same. You see ads on TV and all you see are prim primarily like white faces, um, people with fully functioning limbs. And you see, you know, wheelchair users and people with different color skins just fighting to be even just to get a bit part in an ad so that they look like part of normal society. Is that a part of belonging, Salome, that you think, do you think could that affect how, for instance, you know, the, some of the migrant population in Ireland might help, might help them feel a bit more connected and uh, like they belong and people might see them as belonging? Absolutely. The whole issue of uh, amplifying not only the, the voices, you know, which is the voices, but the disability of uh, people from different backgrounds or, you know, people with a disability, for example, you know, which we try actually to work quite a lot with, you know, organizations and leaders right. That this feasibility is very important, you know, in all the areas of life and where we are. So, like, if people come to this meeting and they can't be able to identify with anybody, if somebody go to seek for support or services and they're not able to identify with the, with that services, it may not that services may actually not have. And let's say if somebody's coming to seek domestic violence support and it's a, an Irish led NGO, if they feel that even what they see around the pictures and everything that is within that it doesn't actually uh, relate to them, they would feel actually that they don't belong. But people are also made not to belong uh, many times, you know, and Madio mentioned it actually when he was talking about uh, the fascist and, and, and all that, you know, the way you are made to feel, you know, either it's through Facebook, it's all through this or social media, uh, people don't see them uh, like that. This year, it's quite interesting because I wanted to become a senator. And for me, it's actually to be able to change policies and to work at policies at very, that very high level. I want to see that. But also people who reaches to that stage, they are all model for the rest of the community. So if you actually end up, you know, being in the media and being involved in, a, in advertising or in, in any sector, you actually give a reflection to somebody else to identify with you and to want to interact with you. It also set it as a role model that if Salome is able to do it, we can be able to do it. So it actually motivates people. It helps them to improve their self-esteem and also the sense of belonging. So at the moment, many people don't feel like they belong because they don't identify with what is happening in, in all public sectors. You know, you go to meetings and even when you raise a point or you say anything, nobody actually to support you. So it's really helping these people, amplifying their voices, like I'm saying, but also their feasibility, feasibility in terms of their representation and participation at the same time. Thank you, Salome. Uh, Matthew, I'll come to you as well. It's hard to imagine the, the idea of uh, white men not feeling like they belong, but there's got to be some lack of connection, connectivity, I'm not suggesting we should suddenly have fascists in TV ads for things, but the question has been asked about, and you're muted there as well, the question has been asked in the questions on the side about how do we understand fascists? Do we need to have empathy for them in order to try and understand? Right. Well, we just go, we shouldn't un don't understand the fascists, but we have to understand the conditions by which they're attacked directly the way that they're influenced by it and also how do we tackle the circumstances by which it, you know fascism uh, becomes attractive to people i think we spoke about there's a lot of people now with more time on their hands to look for these to looking for answers for things i think we have to try and occupy some of those spaces with truth or with reason but i think we shouldn't ever get into a position where we think a fascist has something we need to hear or a fascist has something we want to hear Okay. We have to quarantine fascism. It, it is a disease. Okay. Um, uh, Tia, who's Ayal's wife, said, uh, thank you for sending this in. Tia says, I went to a Catholic primary school in South Africa. The problem with not sending non-Catholics out of the classroom during prayers is that if they stay, they and their parents are likely to feel that they're being indoctrinated against their will. The only real answer is to ban religious schools, make all religious activities optional as extramural activities like piano or chess. Eilish has given me the biggest thumbs up there with that. Yeah, thank you for sending that in to you. That's a really interesting insight. Salome, do you think could that have an impact? Do you feel that religion has an effect on the kids in school in terms of racist, racism towards them? Um, I, I think it's quite challenging, you know, to talk about, um, you know, the schools and all that. And you'll find that, you know, the way 
the setup in Ireland has been, you know, it's it's very very different because uh, the majority um, the, the majority of Ireland, let's say, it comes from the you know the Catholic religion, and so if people are going to follow up that, you know, people have to have their communion, they have to have all these other things that goes you know within the the ethos of the church, you know, that has to be followed. Mm -hmm. um, but you will find that you know most of the children now when they 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 go to the schools and they have to be out of the classes when the, 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 the education for or preparations for the first communions are happening. They feel left out. Um, I think, um, I don't know what can be done in that, but because the diversity have changed, although still majority of the people would be within the very highest percentage of, of that, to make it actually work better and to ensure that children feel uh, not left out. We've had actually, for example, the same same schools uh, during Christmas time preparing plays and making a, a Muslim child, you know, a Jesus or something like that. You know, they, they are, they, they, it's the way you explain that what I want to, to, to mean. It's the way you explain to the people who are involved. It's the way you carry on as a school, as an, an education institute. But I, I agree, we do not actually have to be dominated by one religion, you know, dictating, you know, the ethos of the school and the principles of the school. I think with the changes that are happening in Ireland, it will be very important to review this and make uh, you know the system more inclusive and not wavering one religion over the other because as we move by you know this is going to change and uh, we will have maybe a majority of people coming from other religions and, and, and all that you'll find that also as well that you know we have a lot of evangelical churches now in ireland actually there are many many of them you know you you see people hiring halls you know to be able to have their faith expressed and all that you know because the diversity have changed and so if this diversity has changed it should be the same um with um with what is happening in schools and what is happening everywhere thank you salome just a couple of comments that have been made uh dara hogan has said schedule religious education as the optional last school subject every afternoon don't stand near the door uh, in case you're trampled by departing children uh, Tom White says, the greatest gift I can give anyone is to recognise and engage with their hum humanity. Uh, Roseanne has replied to Tia uh, saying, I think you're preaching to the choir here. A properly secular education system in Ireland would be a dream. And I know that uh, Catherine O'Brien, and apologies if there are other people, she's just one I know, is this seems to be like a driving force in her. So I, I see her nodding there. So she's a, she is a fabulous woman in that regard. Um, let me see as well. Barry O'Mahony says in relation to uh, Teresa, she, he says, um, sorry, I'm flicking between here. Uh, Barry says, Teresa, if the culture of othering people who are different is changed, will we see each other as human, not of religion or color or nation? So uh, maybe a, a final chance to ask a question if you want to type one really quickly. Um, there is a potential one here. If I can scroll. There's lots, and it's great to see people have been engaging so much, and we are almost finished. Oh yeah, this was an interesting one, and, and just maybe one for both of our speakers to give a, um, a, a piece on. And Roseanne asks, that for both speakers from both sides, do coloured people feel like they are being specifically targeted in Ireland by fascists? And I suppose in that, Matthew, you get an extra part of the question saying, does Matthew think fascists really promote racism purp purposely? Matthew, I'll start with you. The second part of, of, of the question, um, racism is just a consequence of fascism because of the sort of society fascists want in panic. Part of the panic is loss of identity, loss of culture, therefore new identities, new culture. Also, is why it's very important, anti-racists must be anti-fascist and anti-fascists anti -fascist must be anti-racist. Okay, thank you. And Salome, is it your experience, well, I suppose you've talked about your experience of people of colour feeling targeted, but specifically by fascists? Or do you think in Ireland there's a sense of, ah, it's just casual everyday racism, as, as Tom, Tom Woolley touched on? Uh, just to tell you that there's everyday racism. And actually, this is very evident, you know, in many people, uh, in particular people of color, African people, uh, many people do feel targeted, you know, by, by the faith system and all that. And I give you a quick example of what has been happening, you know, in Ireland where, you know, young black men are being profiled now as the gangs, you know, the African mm -hmm. gangs. 
Uh, these are young people who, you know, meet together and talk together. They have their own issues, you know, they have their own way of communicating and all that. But they've been targeted quite often, you know, by the fascists actually. And a few months ago, I think it's over a month ago now, there was a house that burned in Babrigan, for example. These all stories are on the media. Um, and it ended up, you know, being said that, you know, it's the black young youth that actually burned the house, but it didn't have anything to do with those black youth. So you would find that actually they are quite often um, targeted. Black people are quite often targeted. Uh, when, we, when you just want to paint things uh, badly or you know, when you just want to blame things, on different people. It has been my experience, you know, that even when you go to meetings or when you go anywhere and you speak, you be targeted, you are, you actually be abused both online and through all the social medias, you know, as a black person and using that very racist language, which is very racist in itself. So just to say that, you know, black people are very visible in terms of their color. So even if there are maybe these young people are with the white indigenous uh, children, if anything happens, the black uh, people, the uh, black children are the ones who are most seen when these incidents happen. So from my own experience, and I only talk from my own experience from myself and the women that I represent over 5,000, it's very true most of the time black people are targeted. Also in terms of, uh, for example, accessing the labor market, and I'm not saying this, but actually the, the research, and I mentioned the um, Economic Social Research Institute, clearly define it very well, even with the employers, they would prefer to employ somebody from the Eastern European than a black person, you know, to be on their front mm -hmm. desk, to be on there. So it's quite often that, you know, uh, black people are normally very, very much um, okay. uh, targeted, yeah. Thank you so much. And I'll just remind people again that there's a couple of resources have popped up in the group chat alongside. Uh, particularly Salome has put up a list of things we can do as groups, communities and individuals, uh, not forgetting the fact checker on the journal. And at this stage, uh, I'm going to hand back. Uh, Roseanne, you might give me a thumbs up or not on this. Do you want me to go to a last question? Have we time? Yes. No. Eamon, are you OK to hang on for another couple of minutes? Okay, so I saw one here that came from AB. Matthew mentioned that fascism stems from the marginalized to a degree, but would he not agree that fascism can begin and be shaped by the higher echelons of society and religious factions created to test society and create these forms of division? He says, this is very endemic of what has happened in the North, for example, via plantation secular, plantation slash secular communities. Yeah, fascism is, is top down. And it's looking for bottom, bottom. It, 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 it's top down. It's um, it also if you if you view fascism fascism in relation to class, um, you don't see lots of sort of middle class public school boys out on the streets with their union jacks shout, shouting racist stuff. But it doesn't mean, of course, that those people don't uh, ag agree with the. The ideas behind it, even if they don't like the, the, the sort of coarse language. Um, with regard to the bit in the north, I don't think it's fair for me to comment on things that happen in your country. Okay, uh, thank you so much, Matthew. One last comment, and then I'm handing to Eamon. Uh, Al, who has thank you so much, you've sent in so many great comments. Does everyone agree this is a wonderful quote? That this wonderful quote needs a terminology update. The only thing necessary for the triumph of evil is for good people people to do nothing. So with that thought, uh, Eamon, I will hand back to you to do all the thanks and the farewells. Thanks a million, Ruth. Um, I've got to go. I'm on date night. Oh, well, in that case, I'll begin with this. Thank you so much, Matthew and Salome. I was going to leave you to the end, but uh, to our speakers who gave us a great presentation. Uh, we're so high in detail thought and for answering our questions as well. We really appreciate you giving up our, our Saturdays. I think a big round of uh, Zoom applause from, from everybody is appropriate. Thanks, Matthew, and uh, it's a long way too. Um, as well, thank thank you everybody for for attending um, for what is you know a very unusual summer school, but the you know the first ever virtual uh, All Ireland Humanist Conference this evening. Um, hopefully, you've enjoyed it as much as I have, and thank you all for, as well for participating so fully in the discussion in the chat function and for giving your questions. Uh, we really appreciate everybody who's given their time to this event uh, this evening. Um, to Aidan, our chair of the HEI, for, for giving the opening address. Tom Woolley of the Irish Free Thinkers for, for giving his reflection um, just before the discussion began. Especially to Scott 
for so ably uh, moderating the discussion and adding um, so much flair to it as well. Uh, and as well, of course, the organizers, Brian McClinton, Mary O'Mahony, Bob Rees, Roger Kelly, Dara Hogan, uh, Murray Doyle, Barry O'Mahony, and of course, Roseanne Riley as well for all the efforts put into putting today together. Um, it's been a great afternoon, I'm sure you'll all agree. I think a big round of applause are appropriate for, for those people involved. And just a reminder that the date for what should have been the uh, 2020 Humanist Conference uh, is now going to be in 2021. So keep the weekend of May 7th and 8th uh, free. We're aiming to be at the Imperial Hotel in Cork and uh, your fingers crossed circumstances allow it and we can once again uh, meet up in person um, for uh, a celebration, an all-island celebration of humanism. So thanks very much, people, everybody. And thank you, Eamon, as well, because you were very much involved as well. So thank you. Bye-bye, every. Thank you, everybody. <laughs>